Hello there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about Texas in the 1960s. In the last lecture, we left off with a little bit of the um, civil rights movement in Texas and how Texas was affected. So we'll get more into depth into that. We'll also talk about, um, you know, the turbulent 1960s um, politically, too, in Texas at that time period. And so uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about regarding this is um, the fact that at this time period, this is very much a time period in which LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, not LeBron James, I know everyone looks at that sometimes and thinks that, but we're talking about um, Lyndon Baines Johnson and his progression as a very influential politician in Texas at that time period. Um, we're also going to talk about some really big shifts uh, during this time period, uh, you know, in the 1960s. Politically, uh, socially, a lot of different reforms happening in Texas. But let's go ahead and start talking a little bit more about LBJ. We talked about him a little bit last time, um, but just to give a brief biography on LBJ, he was from the Valley. Um, and he uh, was a teacher in Catula, Texas. He actually went to Texas State University, which at that time was Southwest Texas um, Teachers College. Um, and he was very affected when he was a teacher uh, by the poverty that he was surrounded by. And it, it ends up really shaping him when he becomes president. So this experience uh, working in the Valley and working with lower income uh, Mexican-American students really has a big effect on him personally. He later becomes the National Youth Administration Director under FDR. We talked about that when we were talking about the Great Depression and New Deal in Texas. And he later he climbs to prominence um, nationally, too, in national politics in Texas. Um, and of course, that very contentious 1948 debate that's still out there, did he really win that or was it, was it really rigged or not? Um, either way, his influence um, can definitely be felt in, in the nation and in Texas as well. So one of the most interesting parts of this time period is actually the 1960 election. And there's a lot of confluence of a lot of different events that were happening at this time. So one thing that was happening was the United States was becoming this very, very focused TV nation. Everybody had a television in their neighborhood, much like people used to have radios in the 1920s. And so for the very first time in 1960, there was a televised debate. And I've got a really great clip that's going to be here in, in, the, um, in, the, in, in this particular module in the content page that goes through the importance of the very first televised debate between Nixon and, um, and JFK and how the television actually probably won the election for JFK. Now, you think about Nixon, I know what you think about. You're thinking about Watergate, the first president that ever, and only president that ever resigned. And it's very important that you think about the 1960 election when you're thinking about Nixon himself. He actually was the vice president under the very popular Eisenhower. And so basically, you know, his administration, Eisenhower's administration was very popular. And so most people really believed that it was just a shoe in that he was going to get this, um, this win. And, and JFK, honestly, was very not it was not well known at all, right? His father was a wealthy businessman from Massachusetts. He was the first Catholic um, that runs as well. So there were things that just kind of stacked against him that a lot of people um, didn't believe that he was going to get very far. He does. He's, he's a pretty shrewd politician, though, from the get go. One of the things that he needed, he knew that the, the Democratic Party was pretty fractured. And so he really tries to get, um, you know, the the Democratic Southern vote, and he does that through LBJ, who was a very popular congressman at that time. And so that was one of the ways that he does this. Now, what's really interesting is that the, um, the television debate is really what wins it for JFK, like I mentioned. Um, there was, there was uh, you know, there was polls that went out that said that uh, people that listened to the debate on the radio actually thought Nixon won, but because JFK was so much prettier and a lot of other things, and you know he had so much more of a stage presence, that the viewers that watched television thought that he won the debate. So that that's kind of an interesting thing, right? Especially as we think about politics today and the the role of debates and things like that. And now here in Texas. Um, the 
Hispanic vote um, was really coming into play during this time period. And this is partially led by San Antonio's own um, Henry B. Gonzalez, who was born in San Antonio, but he was the son of Mexican born parents. Um, he went to St. Mary's, got his law degree there. He served in city council and he worked feverishly um, on, on desegregation in San Antonio and throughout Texas itself. Now he runs against uh, a man named Price Daniel in the presidential election, I'm sorry, the, gov the gubernatorial election of 1958, he loses, but he really starts to turn the heads of Hispanic voters and really galvanizes them towards the Democratic Party, which is going to be really important a little bit later on. One thing that a lot of my students really get curious about is when the Republican parties really begin, the Republican Party in Texas begins to rise. And this is really the point that it begins to rise in the 1960s. Nixon, even though he loses the election, actually gets more Republican votes than any other time in Texas history, um, at least until that point, uh, for a Republican candidate. Also, the Panhandle, West Texas, growing Republican base. There was actually a mayor from Amarillo um, who was part of the John Birch Society, which if you know anything about the John Birch Society, is an extremely right-wing society. That will set the tone for a lot of Republican um, base in Texas, at least in the rural areas, much later on, too. Um, now, there had to be a, a special senatorial race because LBJ, because he became the vice president, left a seat open, right? And that's in 1960. Um, and interestingly enough, a Republican candidate does take that seat. And that's significant because there were too many liberals that were in the pot and they divided up the, the Democratic vote. And so this Republican named Tower um, actually wins the race in that. Um, in the Democratic Party, though, we start to see a shift to a more liberal platform, which we'll actually talk a little bit more about in the next lecture a little bit more. However, even with this shift, we do see a new candidate challenge and win the less moderate Price Daniel John Connolly um, be, to become the next governor of Texas in 1962. And we'll talk about why that is so significant because the next year in Texas was one of very sad history in Texas. And that was, of course, um, the assassination of, um, of JFK in Dallas. Okay, so let's set the stage a little bit. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that's understood is the fact that um, is that Dallas was a very conservative area at that time. There was a big rift in Texas and, and there was a, a large like right wing uh, movement happening in Dallas at that time. And so this was very specifically chosen to travel to Dallas to try to bridge this rift in and of itself. Um, so on November 22nd of 1963, that is the day that um, JFK was shot in his motorcade, and this is the picture here. Um, and you can see JFK and LBJ, and, and actually Governor Con Connolly in that picture as well. Um, and of course, JFK is shot in the back of the head, and, um, and of course, there's lots of debate on whether or not, most people actually, I think even in 1979, you can see the, the date there that the House Select Committee actually did recognize that there had to have been more than one shooter, um, that it had to have been some kind of conspiracy. They just have never really fully proven who the co-conspirators were at the time. So I wanna talk about Governor Connolly a little bit. He was seriously injured. He later told the Warren Commission, which was the first commission said, my God, they are going to kill us all. He looked down and he saw that his chest was covered in blood and he thought he had been fatally shot. Um, and he heard the third and final shot, which hit the back of, the, of JFK's head. He saw like the blood and brain tissue all over the car. Um, he suffered a fracture of his fifth rib, a punctured lung, shattered wrist, and the bullet was lodged in his leg. He went, underwent four hours of surgery. Um, and so, this actually, uh, even though it obviously a very sad event, galvanizes um, Connolly's uh, gubernatorial candidacy, and um, he wins several times in the future um, and becomes extremely popular. He was not that popular of a governor, and then by 1966, he got 72% of the vote. Um, and now this picture is a really iconic picture. Just want to take a moment and talk about this. That picture was when LBJ was on Air Force One and being sworn in as the new president. And he is next to um, Jackie Kennedy, 
And you can tell, that, you know, this is the same outfit that she wore before. You can tell that, you know, over here, and you can see this. And she did that in very intentionally so that people could see, and she knew the pictures were going to be in color, could see her husband's blood on her outfit and brain matter. So, yeah, pretty impactful um, at that. So LBJ becomes the first Texan in the White House. And LBJ, like I mentioned, is a really interesting character. I had this picture of him because he was very well known to be a very close talker, kind of made people extremely uncomfortable. And so that's actually um, part, of, uh, part of his personality, really. He, um, now at that time period, uh, Kennedy had actually started on some civil rights bill um, bills, but LBJ is the one that sees those bills through, and he sees extremely significant civil rights bills. Um, two of the most significant, the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Bill, with which desegregated all public places, um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, also significant after the Selma March, and um, and so, and he is also the president when the poll tax is actually added to the Constitution and made illegal, although Texas is going to do the poll tax in the state, at least state elections for a while after that. One of the other most significant things about LBJ was something known as the Great Society. Now, you, you might remember what I mentioned before about LBJ and about the fact that he was greatly affected by being a teacher in the Valley and seeing the poverty that people suffered. And so he pushes through one of the largest social reform programs since the New Deal. Um, it's still controversial, much like the New Deal was. Uh, this is where Medicaid and Medicare comes from. This is where Head Start comes from. So a lot of programs that were started with the Great, uh, Great Society program are still there. They were all part of um, LBJ's uh, attempt to have what he, he called a war on poverty because there were a lot of people that were impoverished um, people were moving from the urban areas to the suburbs we talked last time about redlining that kept uh, brown and black people out of um, the su suburbs for quite a while and relegated them to the ghettos and so um, you know at, at LBJ does a very intentional job of trying to curb this um, as as president um, Connolly serves as governor in Texas. He was as popular, like I mentioned, as Reagan was at the time. He wanted to improve higher education in particular. He does increase and, and raises taxes for the increase of the UT system. That's where you start to see other UT um, branches besides UT Austin begin to grow really. Also the medical community in Texas really grows, particularly in Houston, first successful coronary heart bypass and um, other you know, beginning works on mechanical heart as well. Um, all right, so shifting gears a little bit, I told you I talked to you a little bit about um, about the civil rights movement in testifying. Um, the historically black college and university, Wiley and Bishop during this time period, 1960s was an absolutely monumental time in civil rights history because this is the time in which the young become very um, focused on civil and social rights. And, and so this is when college students really become the center focus and they kind of take the movement and carry the torch on it. And so we see a lot of students at Texas Southern, UT, uh, North Texas State, uh, protesting against um, segregation specifically. We see a lot of the same things in Texas as we do in other parts of the country, like Birmingham in 1963, which is where MLK wrote letters from, a letter from a Birmingham jail, in which police departments were using fire hoses to stop peaceful protests. Um, uh, however, Texas, even with all of this effort, um, still remained segregated um, through the 1970s. And the only reason it, it later became desegregated. Um, and I wanna you know, pause that and say that there were many cities like San Antonio that, that did it before um, federal intervention to desegregate the area. But, um, but it is very uh, interesting that we see a lot of the similar ones, just not as much success in some parts of the other country. Um, and also there's a, there's a movie, I'm gonna add this as extra credit because this is a great movie. It's called The Great Debaters. It's about this man over here who was one of the co-founders of CORE, which is Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and this was a very significant civil rights organization at the time. And he was part of, he was the young person on the Great Debaters movie. And so um, and it's a story about Wiley College, um, historically, for our first historically black college in Texas. So definitely want you to see that. 
Okay, the other group that begins to become very active during this time period was um, Mexican Americans. And actually, the source of our podcast for this unit is going to be on um, on a melon strike, very significant one, as part of the Chicano Chicano movement in Texas. Really, people see that as the beginning of the Chicano Chicano movement in Texas itself. So during this time period, like I mentioned before, with Henry B. Gonzalez really pulling a lot of Mexican Americans into the Democratic Party, there were Viva Kennedy, the Viva um, Johnson clubs, there were political organizations that were formed. Uh, but in 1966, organizers marched a minimum wage walk. Okay, they marched 500 miles from the Rio Grande to to Austin. Now, what's interesting is that Connolly attempts to intervene and stops them in the runfuls and is like, hey, you know what? This is probably not a good idea. Let's not do that. Well, of course, that just pisses everybody off. And so it almost just reinvigorates them that the that the, the people, the white people in, in Austin were attempting to stop them from this protest. So it actually gained more momentum. And on Labor Day, um, they're met by Cesar Chavez in uh, in Austin, and it becomes like the galvanizing moment in um, in Chicano Chicano movement in Texas itself. Um, Henry B. Gonzalez also was elected to Congress um, from San Antonio in 1961. So we see a strong movement um, of Chicano Chicano movement in Texas at this time. The other thing that we see happening at this time also is a movement into what's known as the New Left. Uh, movement and this really the center of this was uh, was in Austin, UT Austin, and so like I mentioned before, 1960s was a really important time period for college students that were very politically active, and we see the center of that leftist activity really in UT Austin. College campuses become like the center of the intellectual base of this like liberal movement. It used to be the labor unions and that swayed away. Now it's now it's college campuses. Um, there's two significant people from this movement, uh, Casey Hayden and Jeff Knightley. I think he's still alive and she, I think she died at the age of 94. But essentially they were part of this Christian liberalism uh, that believed that it was, you know, a Christian duty to um, believe in desegregation and things like this and other people's everybody's equality and equality equal rights um, so that was kind of significant too at that time we also see some police departments specifically Houston's police department that was somewhat infiltrated by the KKK and were abusive to protesters on this new left and there were many universities including UT Austin and San Antonio College that clamped down on um, on Vietnam war protests at that time as well. Um, there is a huge, this and this is part of this new left movement, but a big counterculture movement in this time period. And counterculture was basically the movement that was kind of against the norms of society, this 1950s strict, everybody's got to look the same and be the same, kind of what we saw in our 1950s post-war module. It's really a buck against this system. And it was centered around drugs, it was centered around free love and sex, and it was centered around, um, you know, music, very much centered around music. Um, so uh, Austin becomes the center, UT Austin becomes the center of counterculture in the 1970s in Texas at that time. We also see Janis Joplin, who was actually from Port Arthur. She worked at a restaurant in Austin called Thread Girls, which is where she gets her start. And of course, she is a significant person in the counterculture movement. We also see Armadillo World Headquarters at that time, too. Now, the last thing we'll talk about here is um, some mainstream uh, culture and sports that start to become popular in Texas at this time. We see art museums and architecture sprout up all across major cities in Texas, like the McNay, um, like Trinity University, some of their buildings done by a very famous um, architect by named O'Neill Ford. And we also see very significantly all the big you know, sports teams begin to happen. Um, Astrodome was created in 1965. I don't know if you know this little bit of tidbit of history, but Astrodome was the first enclosed area and they made an artificial turf, which they called AstroTurf because of the Astrodome. I think that one. And of course the Cowboys, um, 1960s, uh, was, was established in 1960 by 1978. It's called America's Team. And the Texas Rangers moved to Arlington in 1972. Okay, so that's it with this one. The next one we're going to move into our next decade in Texas, Texas in the 1970s.